further ado, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce my good friend, Roger Youngblood, who, uh, when we say man moment machine, this is the man who was there uh, at that time who can tell it from the horse's mouth. And as I said to him today out on the ramp, uh, I said, thank you. And he said, why? And I said, because if you guys had just said, oh, we don't want to fly those airplanes, or, and you'll understand the comment later at the end of his story, but I said, if you and Jack had just said, oh, those airplanes are ratty, or we got something else to do, we don't want to fly them, I said, this airplane would not be here today. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Roger Youngblood. Thank you. It's really my honor to be with you. Uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to talk about this. And uh, just to tell you, Sometimes my emotions are on my sleeve, so bear with me. I want to thank Neil and his wife and this great museum for all they've done. It's just unbelievable. I want to thank Don for everything that he's done. If it weren't for him calling me on the phone, I probably wouldn't be here and saying, hey, how about coming on into Tennessee? And this man right here, Ken, put it all together for me. I sent him some pictures and told him some lies and he, he kind of put it together. And let me just say this. Uh, I, I'm not a professional speaker, but if you have a question, just raise your hand. I, there's no problem there. Just interrupt me and say, well, what about this? And that's the way I like to do it and keep it informal. So sometimes you hear somebody say you were at the right place at the right time. And that's about the way it was for me. Yogi Berra said, when you come to the Y in the road, take it. Well, that's kind of what I did. <laughs> I, I volunteered or got into the Air Force after I got out of college, just to give you a quick brief of where I was and how I got to this position. And everybody was going, I was at Reese, and everybody was going to Vietnam, and I, I looked at all the airplanes and the pictures and what was going on, and I told my squadron commander that I wanted to fly that bird. Well, that bird was the A-1. It just sequenced in our graduation class that we didn't have but one A-1 and two R uh, F-4s and the rest were trash haulers and you name it. And so I graduated not at the top of my class. I didn't go to the Air Force Academy. So, you know, I just uh, talked to my squadron commander and believe it or not, I, I hauled trash for a year in Vietnam. But the day I got to Vietnam, I walked into personnel and I said, I want to re-up for another year. Of course, he fell over. But no, I, I, I'm serious. He said, you haven't been here long enough to make that decision. I said, I made that decision a long time before I got here. So anyway, I volunteered for the A-1 and about two weeks after I got into Saigon, uh, I had my orders to NKP and I was a happy Jose for the rest of that year. The uh, transition from one year in Vietnam to Hurlburt to check out, uh, then back into NKP. Uh, that was great. I went through the uh, Jungle Survival School for the second time. And like somebody said, I got there one day after the school started. So I spent a week at the pool and taking it easy in San Miguel City over there. So anyway, I uh, got into the A1s and, and, and I just loved them. I, I just couldn't. I mean, when that thing cranks up, uh, whether you know it or not, it's just like sitting uh, on the biggest Harley Davidson you've ever had. <laughs> and it's got a wild ass cam and it just sits there and lopes. Yes, sir. What year were we talking about? I was in 6907 at Reese, and then I went to the uh, RTU at uh, Herbert, 
then to, I, I guess I was in 70, 75, 70, no, about 71 or two, uh, getting into Saigon and then back to Hurlburt for the A1 and then back to NKP. And I'll just kind of bring this up to speed to keep it going. When I was getting towards the end of my A1 tour, I had asked to fly SAR, Sandy's, because that just meant more to me than bombing Cabot patches and all that stuff. So uh, I was flying Sandy's and I really loved it. And General Adderholt had sent a message up to the wing commander. And by the way, he had been the wing commander at NKP in previous years, flying T-28s. It's another story when you got time. So he asked for any of the A1 guys to volunteer to come back and uh, be T-28 instructors in the Thai squadrons that he was overseeing because he was the commander of just made joint U.S. military advisory group in Mac Thai. So at that time we were getting trash assignments, what I considered trash, <coughs> back to ATC and desk jobs and you name it. So I said, hey, I'll go. So he sent me to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California for a year, which is another hardship tour, uh, studying the Thai language. And when you get out of that 42-week course, and it is submersion eight hours a day, uh, I figured I had a toolkit where I could get by. So I got into Thailand, and the day I walked into his office and said, sir, I'm back, you know, take it easy, I'm here. He had an eight by 10 picture and he slid it around to me and I don't know what the next slide would might be but that's me flying the Sandys let me just talk to these pictures a minute that's the Sandy load uh, is a the guy that loaded weapons here yeah okay you got six uh, CBUs two uh, white phosphorus two Lao threes and two Lao sevens I think uh, or 19 that one of them's got 19 one of them's got seven I think you probably know that. And a minigun on the left stub, 300 gallon and 150 gallon and 420s. And uh, that's a candid photo, by the way. I didn't pose for that. It, oh, oh, although it looks like it. We had Air Force Now over there filming search and rescue because we'd rescued somebody and they wanted to put it in the paper. And they were walking around in the ramp area and just clicking, clicking, clicking. And I'm talking actually to my wingman in the next revetment. You can't see over there if you don't get on the airplane. And I'm telling him something, I don't know what, but anyway, I didn't even know that picture was made until I got ready to leave to go back to the States to DLI. And the, the guy that runs a newspaper and all on base says, hey, young blood, I got some pictures you might want to take back with you. I said, yeah, okay. So I finally went over there before I got on the Klongbird. And that there it was. And I said, my goodness, where's that? And he said, well, back in the Air Force nowadays, that was taken. So that's been with me for a while. So let's get out of that. <laughs> anyway. There's the younger version of me as a T-28 uh, instructor, but that black and white photo that General Adderholt turned around and shoved at me was the AU-24 Peacemaker. There was a program at Eglin Air Force Base called Incredible Chase. And at one time, we were gonna build hundreds and hundreds of the AU-23 uh, and the AU-24. We're gonna give one, uh, we were gonna fly up and down Ho Chi Minh Trail and do some good work with night vision at night and the XM-197 gun out the left side. Well, I wound up going to the second wing at, at Lopebury, uh, second Air, uh, Royal Thai Air Force Base wing, and I was there by myself except for my engine mechanic. Uh, he would not send me there to work under their mechanics, and I, w I was appreciative of that. So there was one tech sergeant and myself at that base, period. So I use my little toolbox of Thai, and I'm guaranteed I got my doctor's degree in about a year and a half in speaking Thai. You know when you can speak Thai when they can joke and you understand the joke. <laughs> so that, that was it. This is the AU-24 with the XM-197. That's the Cambodian airplane. So we've sent about 13 or so of those to uh, Pochitong and Phnom Penh, and then the AU-23 was up at Lok Bari where I was teaching. And I'll tell you a quick, short story. One day, uh, one of these showed up, and in the left seat was this, looked like American. You know what a safari suit is. You know immediately when they get out in a safari suit, it's a CIA. So that's just the way it was. So he gets out at flying that, and he comes over and he says, uh, here's some orders, and it was from Adderholt via via to me. 
to assist this man in any way I could. And that's about as open ending as you can get. So I said, what you got? And he said, well, I got some young pilots. He called them pilots from Cambodia that want to learn how to fly this airplane. And he said, I'm going to bring them over here to the second wing because you've got a target practice range over here. And I want you to teach them how to fly at 3,000 feet in a 30 degree bank and shoot anything that moves on their trail. So I said, okay, so it's, I'll, I'll get this over with. He comes over with some of these guys, and this is the way it is. The Cambodian pilot, who was about equivalent to our T-37 pilot. If you got a guy in T-37s and that's all the training he gets in the U.S. Air Force, uh, that's about what level they were. And I don't know how they got as, as experienced as they did, but that's the way it was. So he puts a Cambodian pilot in the left seat. I'm in the right seat, and he's sitting in a seat that's pulled up right behind the two of us. And at the time, we didn't have the gun in there because that's where the gunner sits and all that. So the gun was out, and we were just trying to check him out in this airplane. So I had one rule. I said, look, I said, when I shake the stick, you get off of it. I got it. But there was only one problem. He didn't speak English. So <laughs> it's the way it was. I told the guy, the CIA guy in English, he told the Cambodian in French. And the Cambodian guy in French, I think, understood it. Because I told him, I said, if he doesn't understand it, bong, and I got the airplane. So, you know, I, 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 this, this is a, unbelievable. This kind of stuff would never go on today. But uh, I was just trying to train them. So we, we flew each guy four sorties. Touch and go, touch and go, touch and go. And this, this airplane and, and the Stowe Porter are unbelievable. I thought I'd really flown something, but when I got in this, I started to learn how to fly something. This thing stalls at 42 knots. And if you hold the stick back between your legs all the way, it'll go up and stall, it'll drop off, and as soon as it picks up above 42 knots, it's flying again. And you can just do this all day long. It's got leading edge slats and trailing edge flaps, and you can come in, and if you've ever seen any of these bush pilots land up in Alaska, that's just about what this thing does. And it'll carry rocket pods, and it'll carry that gun, and it's a, yes? Did you experience civilian nomenclature for that airplane? Pilatus Porter built the first stove short takeoff and landing airplane, and it's gone all over the world. They used it in the Swiss Alps to go get climbers that got stuck and land on nothing. And so, you know, we decided we were gonna have a, as we do, a fly off at Eglin Air Force Base, incredible chase. Well, it was so incredible, they killed the program. And they gave the 23 to the ties and the 24. So here's Adderholt saying, go teach the ties to, to fly this airplane. So that's how I got into that. Short field landing with that airplane. How short? Oh, 500 feet, maybe. Right. If you, oh, if you ever went to Udorn and you'd see those silver planes parked over there, that was Air America. And they had a lot of porters. Of course, they had a lot of, a lot of air. Yes, sir? I escorted one of those into a uphill landing site there. I didn't land there. Yeah. <laughs> that was something to watch. Well, there's a story I'll, I'll tell someday about running out of fuel practically on final getting into Don Mong because I got in that airplane and I did not know the right fuel pump in the right wing did not work. So the airplane kept getting just a wee bit heavier and I kept seeing one gauge on full and one gauge going down and I said, this is not good. And so I was in trot, which I'll show you in a minute, rescuing some Vietnamese people. And I had put a Vietnamese pilot in the right seat to take back with me to Don Mong. This is kind of breaking the story. But anyway, I missed. Ju I took off too late, about 4 o'clock, and it got dark. And I knew trot, you know, 260, 270 degrees, I'm going to run into the big lights of Don Mong. I'll, I'll land at Bangkok. Well, the wind out of the west had drifted me over, and I was somewhere quite a ways from Bangkok, and I did not see the lights. And there was a 1,000-foot undercast, and I was in trouble, and I knew it. And, and I... Anyway... <clears throat> I looked off to the left as I was flying north, and I happened to see what I think today was a 747, and all I could see was the rudder. 
it had gone into the clouds and at the top of that rudder was a strobe. It blinked two times and went in the clouds. I turned that porter and I aimed that thing right for the last time I saw that red light and I flew and all of a sudden through the clouds there was the runway lights for Don Mock. And you ask about how short you can land, I, I turned a short base and, and I think the Vietnamese guy was <laughs> happier to see this place than I was because <laughs> he can read fuel gauges too. <laughs> and so if you've ever been into Don Mong in the old days, the number one for takeoff area, it, it's, it's, it's probably two, three hundred foot wide. I don't know. Anyway, I landed on the first brick and as I, I'm serious, and as I turned off, I stopped just much as I could and turned off onto the number one way to get onto the runway. The engine died and that was it. So here I am. <laughs> so just to orient you just for a second, I was up at the second wing and working for Adderholt, who is the greatest man ever. This is Saigon, where I was before. I'm going to show you another uh, little map. You can flip it to trot. I, I brought these along. I got these off of Amazon.com, actually. And uh, there is a trot. This is the uh, parrot's beak, known as the parrot's beak. This is uh, Phnom Penh. Right along in here in this border is, is real beachy areas and the guys that took off in their UH-1s that they, they knew to head to get feet wet and if they ran out of gas they just landed on the beach and some did but most of them made it on into Thailand. This little arrow points to trot, T-R-A-T. That is a 4,000 foot grass strip and when Adderholt told Jack Drummond and I to go get those A1s at Utapau. At the same time, he said, there's a lot of people that are not going to make it to Utapau. Utapau is right in here. So coming across, that's where they were trying to get. But when they couldn't make it, they were instructed to, to fly into trot. And there was many helicopters along here. There was an A-37 that landed on the highway ran out of gas, Vietnamese. When he landed on the highway, it shook up the whole little city there, you can understand. They pushed the airplane into a schoolyard. Well, raise the canopy, the man, his wife, and three children get out of that airplane. Uh, and that was not a single instance. We had an 01 man, wife, and two kids. He put a kid on each one of the consoles and the wife somehow got up behind him, you know, and, and they, you know, it's life or death. So on April 29th, when the, the Sierra hit the fan, most of the people were getting anything that would crank and they were headed to uh, Thailand. All in all, if I can look at my notes for a second, we wound up getting some uh, 90 aircraft came out of Cambodia but let me just tell you, Adderholt had an ops plan for that. He went to the ambassador in Cambodia and he said, I want all of your T-28s, I can get everybody out. But you're, the, the Khmer Rouge is, is here and they're knocking on the door. And that ambassador listened to him and they got everybody out. They got all the airplanes out. We had a big SAR with the uh, A-7s uh, overhead uh, covering for the Jollies. And I think there might've been a C-130, I'm not sure. It went in there and got the ambassador out and all that. But it was a clean deal. Adderholt went to the ambassador in, in Vietnam and said, I got a plan. I can get everybody out of here. I can get all the airplanes and, and save everybody. And that ambassador was such an ass. He said, look, he said, that would be a signal of defeat. We're not leaving. Well, two weeks later, the roof fell in nearly on his head if it had still been there. But we lost a lot of stuff. We, 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 when we did leave and run, the South Vietnamese, we left a lot of good airplanes sitting on the ramp in a lot of places. And that, and that was just another administrative uh, foul up. Anyway, on the 29th, and this is 42 years ago today, if y'all be thinking about that. Two weeks ago, Cambodia was falling on the 15th. And next week, that airplane was on its way. This was on this ramp out of Vietnam over to uh, 29th and 30th. So we're nearly 42 years to the day when it happened. So this is a really a 
unbelievable time for me to talk about it. So when the Vietnamese scattered and came out, I have some pictures out of this magazine. Aaron Spade. Saigon. And when it was coming, it was coming. Rockets were falling. People were scrambling. <coughs> that artist rendition is so perfect. There's a guy, A-37, him, his wife, his two kids, etc. And, and you'd see C-47s coming in. I'll show you another one. Here's a C-47 coming in. And I was standing there. This is a Wild West show. I mean, there are no rules. You want to put it down, put it down. Going north, going south, just get everybody out of the way. We had airplanes, helicopters. <laughs> One helicopter gunship from South Vietnam landed in the middle of the B-52 ramp. And that caused a little bit of <laughs> jittering because those things were, you know, it's precious to SAC. SAC operates in a different world, as most of you know. Anyway, as the things would land, they would push them off. The F-5s, A-37s, AC-119s, C-130s would land and it looked like a sardine can open. That's cause you, the, the people just never stopped coming off. In my total time at Trot, down south, which I'll show you in a minute, the youngest person that we got out was four days old. The oldest person we got out was 94, grandmother. So, and, and you know, so here's this little grandmother gets off this Huey with gray hair and in her little uh, Vietnamese dress, and I am not lying to you, she's holding a, a, a what I would call like a Ziploc baggie, but it's a plastic bag now. In, in, in Asia, they tie the top, they tie everything, the, the plastic bag. Inside of the blast, plastic bag and water was a goldfish. So that's what she wanted out. She brought her goldfish. The other girl got off the, the Huey. She was about 18, 19. She had her four day old baby. So here's. Here's this baby, four days old, coming to freedom. This was the whole story. So Adderholt calls me up on the phone. He calls Jack Drummond. Jack Drummond had been working for him since, I don't know, they planted elephant grass in Asia, I guess. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he, he and Adderholt had been doing T-28s and over on the Burma coast and Laos and you name it. If you ever can get that book that Ken showed you up there, read it. That man is unbelievable. He did stuff that, that you know, he, he would work all day as a wing commander at uh, NKP, and he would get with Jack at night, and he would sit in the back seat of the T-28, and they'd go drop bombs on the trail. And then he'd come back, and he had the only car on base with an air conditioner. He slept in his car, because that's back when it, there was PSP, and that was back when the days were... Men were men back there at NKP. So anyway, we tried to get every F-5 we could out of there, and we got them all. And this was a 
one time practice. We didn't do so good with this bird. We dropped it in the ocean. It slipped out of the sling. So from that time on, they lifted them and put them on a flatbed, took them down to the port, on the port, on a barge. Adderholt had them bring this thing up to, I thought it had dry docked. I mean, it was, it was a flat deck of helicopter ship or some kind of flat deck, and it was right up at the shoreline. And they started stacking F5s on now. These are F5Es, brand new. These F5s became our aggressor squadron at Nellis in the short follow-on years. So we put them to good use. A-37s, top of the line. Some of them had been brand new off the production line given to the Vietnamese. And if you needed to make room, you simply pushed a Huey overboard or whatever, you know. Next. This is my partner in crime, Jack Drummond. He was a, he worked training everybody that flew the T-28 in Asia because Adderholt had him going everywhere, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Thailand, water pump uh, at Udorn, uh, you name it. Okay, just once again, this is Trot, this little grass strip where I was trying to recover people. This is Utapau where they were all trying to get into, and this is where 11 A1s wound up, and the one that was on our ramp this morning wound up there. Another one, 606, Ken is having painted at Delta, which is thanks to Ken, or it wouldn't have been done. It'll be at Cavanaugh next month for their air show. And there's an E-model coming in, I think, from Colorado. And it was, I think, one of the four. All right, and then there's another H-model, I think, on chocks at the Smithsonian or something, <coughs> awaiting more parts than there are available, I guess. This is an unbelievable thing. We built nearly every one of these runways, every foot of concrete that was poured. Every time we built a, a place, that, that whole city just tripled, quadrupled in size, and of course businesses, and everybody had to have a tailor, stitching tailor to make your jacket. So when we got through with our little soiree of what I call repositioning previously owned U.S. products, <laughs> they, call it, they called it stealing, and I said, no, no, we just repositioned some previously owned stuff we had. We went and had this patch made over here. And it's an A1 patch showing the last flight and the date and uh, last flight of the youth center. I'm very proud of that. We had two patches made. Jack gave me one and I gave him the mortgage to my house. So that, that is an honor to wear that because that is a one of a, the whole thing is a once of a lifetime deal. If I would, Jack and I would try to do that today in our Air Force, you'd be court martial, sent to Leavenworth, hard labor for the rest of your life and no food and no water. So, you know, I just, like I said, it was a Wild West show. Uh, you made the rules. When we got down to uh, Utapau, airplanes were everywhere, on the grass, everywhere. No, no organization, anything, except they started pulling the A1s over and pushing them off the side of a, a taxiway. When the SAC built that place and they knew they needed a big taxiway with a lot of hard surface, they took the dirt from the you know, you're right on the ocean. They took all the dirt and they pushed it up and they pushed it up and packed it and packed it so the BB-2s could tax it. Well, that laid some, laid some pretty good, what we call in Texas, bar ditches. I mean, it's, it's pretty deep. Well, January to June is the monsoon season in Thailand. And I'm telling you, right when these things came out in late May and April, uh, April and May, the monsoon season was rain every day, then stop. Rain every day, then stop. Well, that night before we went down to look at the A1s, at Adderhole told us to go check out. It rained like you wouldn't believe. When we walked out to the airplanes, we got down there, and I took a porter to Don Mong, picked him up, and went to Utapau. We landed, we got us a truck, and went out there, and the, the people that worked for base ops had at least put the A1s together but they were in the bar ditch. We walked out there, we, we went out on the taxiway, we got out of the truck and we walked. The water was above the tires. They were sitting in the water above the tires. Now, a lot of y'all are pilots, a lot of y'all been there and back. If you ever went out to an airplane and it's sitting underwater and you say, I think I'll just crank it up and take it up to Tok Lee. Well, <laughs> that, you gotta get your mindset on what was going to happen here. Cause Adderholt said, I want them out of there, get as many as you can. Nobody, I don't even think, our State Department I know didn't know because the State Department is the one that shut it down. 
So we look at him, and we got a Chief Master Sergeant Day. What a man. If they ever make a statue at Hurlburt to Chief Chief, he ought to be it because he, he's been there longer than ever, and he knew everything about the A1, T28, AC-47, you name it. He was down there, and he found a Navy crew chief that had worked on A1s back when. The two of them got together, and we asked him, we said, can you get these A1s out of the water? And they said, if we can find a tow bar and a truck, we'll start pulling them out. Well, that was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and we said, okay. So the next morning, we fly back down there, and we go out, and he had two of them lined up. The one that's here was the first one. And the one that's coming today, the E-model, they were lined up. Well, being a lowly captain, Major Jack Drummond pulled rank on me and said, I got the H, you got the E. Well, what we were going to do, and this was funny till we got up to the airplane, we were said, well, let's just take the E up and check it out and let's get, let's land and let's take, let's get a feel for it. We got up on the wings and looked in, no right seat, no right seat and no stick. So he says, you don't want to fly with me, and I can't fly with you, so we're just taking them up like they are. And I said, okay. So we're looking in these airplanes. You know what a 781 is? That's just your normal maintenance records for the airplane. No maintenance records. No checklist. We looked at these airplanes. There is nothing in there. I mean, it's just the plane. No pins in the guns. We thought, you know, but when they scrambled out of wherever they left, they didn't take time to say, oh, a crew chief, give me those pins. I want to take them with me. You know, I'm not coming back. No, no, no pins. And the thing was, and this is the thing that you just, where the rubber really meets the road. The night before when it had rained so hard, the canopies had been left open. You sit on your parachute and it is solid silk. And I looked at that chute or that seat and you could literally squeeze up the water between your fingers. And Jack said, not me, not me. Well, not me didn't mean we weren't going to fly it. It just mean we were going to leave the pin in the seat. So we flew those four airplanes back to Tak Lee with the pin in the seat and our finger off the trigger because we didn't know if they had rounds in the guns or what was going to happen. So I'm just trying to give you a feel of this Wild West show. And Adderholt said, do it, and we were going to do it. So that first day we got in those airplanes, and we, we talked. We, we stood around for a while. We said, look, I, I remember, and it was three years and a month or two since I had flown the A-1. Three years. Six years for Jack when he had gotten checked out at Hurlburt and then went on some other wild mission for Adderholt and really never flew the A-1 at NKP or anywhere else. But he had gotten checked out. So we said, look, it's 16 blades. I said, you set this throttle about here. You got your mixture. You got your prop. I said, after 16 blades, just go to both and pray. And so <laughs> pretty close to that is exactly what happened. We sit in. Now, I didn't have an A1 harness, but he had been flying T28s. He brought two T28 harnesses down, and just so happened that the coke fitting fit here. So once we got in with the pin in the ejection seat, we weren't going anywhere, but we locked ourselves in in case... We had to belly land somewhere or whatever. So we had a harness, we strapped in, we cranked it up, and both of them were just sitting there. And it was just like 42 years ago when I heard that one crank. <coughs> this morning. Anyway, it was a, it's, it's quite a feeling because that's the airplane, uh, I guess, that I, I really uh, love the most. Anyway, we taxied out, and as it would be, there were two Jolly Greens sitting on the side of the taxiway. Unbelievable. They were there to go get any more straggling Vietnamese. We called Tower and said, Sandy 1, fly to 2, taxi for takeoff. Unbelievable just how it's all happening. So we're taxiing by these Jolly Greens. They're waving to us. We're waving to them. That was... <clears throat> That was the original SOAR group right there. Roger, how long after the airplanes landed in Thailand was this thing flying out? They were landing fairly quickly. They started on the 29th, 30th. Like today's the 20, what, 6th, 7th? 
Okay, in two days they started coming out. Little, 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 but 11 or 12 A1s, uh, C-47s were, and it wasn't just from uh, Saigon. They were coming from everywhere, Canto, Benoit, uh, Da Nang, anywhere as, they, as the bad guys were coming, and they were, the, the general that ran the North Vietnamese army was, was approaching, uh, he had already overrun Benoit, and that's why they got out first, and then the, the rockets started coming in, as that picture described, into Saigon. And, and that, it's life or death, they gotta go. So tw I'd say 26, 27, 28, 29, they knew that they had to do something. And they kept most of their aircraft fueled, but at the same time, they, they had never flown more than you know 50 miles out here and talked to the uh, South Vietnamese Army and bombed some you know, Path at Lao, Khmer Rouge, Viet Cong, whoever, you know. So it wasn't like they'd go cross country. So them heading across Cambodia, hey, 270 and keep going until you see the Thai Buddhists and everything else. So, I mean, it was, it was you know, and they had written down, we had one uh, map that we had recovered, Utapau Tower, Tiger 01. That's all he had, that's all he knew how to say and that's all he probably knew how to write down. And he was gonna turn down initial and he was gonna call them and that was it. And he was probably gonna call them on guard because he had no clue what the tower frequency was. So anyway, we taxi out past these Jolly Greens. I'll try to keep this together. I get scattered here. We get to number one, and I'm sitting there thinking, I said, you know, I, I said, here we sit, and I review again with you just for a second. Four guns, you don't know if they'll shoot. The pin is in the seat. The brakes have been underwater all night. If I have to abort, is one gonna grab, and am I gonna go cartwheeling over and roll or whatever? I mean, it's, it's, it's a land of unknowns. But we were going to talk Lee. So they cleared us on the runway and we got out there and, and, and I saw Drummond, I, we given each other 10 seconds, so I gave him 10 seconds. Gave him 15 actually. So he lifted off and, and they, as he was uh, back up, as he's going down the runway, he had set his flaps somewhere, I don't know what. We were just saying, keep the needles in the green. If we keep the needles in the green, we're okay. You know, <laughs> oh, it's funny. So. He, he gets it on the step at about 50 knots and he got that tail wheel up and he's rolling and then all of a sudden I see him this and this and then it comes up and he sucked that gear up and I said, all right, one for the team. And so <laughs> I said, let's go, baby. And boy, when you throttle that thing up, what, about 52 inches, whatever it is, Max, I am telling you, it, it just, that burst of that beast is like unbelievable. So we're rolling and I said, you know, if something goes wrong, I'm not getting on the brakes. I'll roll off the end of the runway. I'm just going to throttle back and just try to settle down and then tap so lightly because I didn't know, like I said, if they would even work. So that thing took off. Gear handle worked. I heard that. I said, thank you, Lord. And Jack had turned out and did a big S turn to give me time to kind of catch up. I moved into right route, and here we are. That's Jack. Flying 332, cockpit is open. So if we had the gear handle down and the gear didn't work and we bellied in or rolled over, he wouldn't be trapped in the cockpit. At least he might have a chance to get out some way. I'm in this uh, fat face, right? 606, okay. I'm in 606, which is the one that Kavanaugh's got. And I'm taking pictures and, you know, I just, I don't even know why I was taking pictures. <laughs> I mean, I should have been just scared to death, but and, and you look back 42 years ago and you say, boy, am I glad I took that photo. Am I glad I took that, and Jack's glad I took that photo. His family's glad he took that photo. That's the Chapia River, so here we go. So I move up just a little bit, taking a few more click clicks. Okay. We landed at Tak Lee. That's my younger, younger brother on the left. I'm just kidding. So this group captain, they have this crazy rank in Thailand. It's, I think it's Navy rank. The group captain is a one-star general, and every base has a group captain. He's standing on the ramp because he knows we go down initial just like we were supposed to go down initial. We pitch out Sandy 01, Sandy 02, base. When I, he rolls out on downwind and I'm behind him and I see the gear come down, I said, all right, we got one gear down. 
and I do this, and I'm listening, and, whoop, and you hear it, clank, and then I say, all right, we got two gear down. Now will they stop? You know, I said, well, you know, we, well, we had flown for, I, I don't know how long it was to get up there, I guess an hour or maybe longer, and I said, you know, they may have dried out a little bit on the way up here. Maybe they'll work. So he touches down, and he said, I'm down. And I said, yep, yep. And so 606, and I was right behind him, and I said, I guess since I'm airborne, I'm the last A1 pilot to fly because you're on the ground. <laughs> and he didn't like that too much. <laughs> but I'm just joking with him. I'm just joking with him. And we did have a few uh, drinks later to talk about that. So anyway, we pull in and turn over the airplanes to the, those are two T-28 harnesses, turn them over to the ties. And we went back the next day, and a funny little thing happened. First of all, we had a C-12, if you all know what that is, a Beach King Air. They were directed by Adderholt to follow us up to Talk Lee. So when we landed, they landed right behind us, and they picked us up to take us back down there to get some more. And we had a few glitches at Utapau that was keeping us from flying the next two out, so we had to wait till the next day. But we were on VHF talking back and forth about, hey, well, what do you think about this? Or what, what flap setting? Or what about, you know, push this up, check this, and all. Okay, I'm good. You're good. The C-12 crew was listening to us all the way up there. So when we get in the airplane, flying back, we're sitting up there just behind the cockpit, and the captain turns back and he says, I never heard two pilots talk about how to fly the airplane as they were flying the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, man, you got to talk about it, you know. What's the deal? So they were just, it was a hoot and a holler for them, that, you know. So we land at Takali, turn those birds over, go back down. The next morning we go out to Utapau, and by then, I mean, there was just so many people in different little squared off areas, refugee camps. I walked into base ops to tell them we were gonna get two more. And you know what a C-130 pallet is, pretty big. There was two of them laying by the front of the base ops. And it was piled, oh, not as high as I am, but it was piled with AK-47s, grease guns, pistols, all that stuff had come out from the C-47s, the AC-1, or the C-130s, the A-1s, all that. They fleeced them all. When the guys got out of the airplane right there, MPs, the whole deal, they, they, they check them, check them, check them, worse than TSA. So <laughs> they let them in, but they all those guns were there. I mean, this was, I, I, to say Wild West Show is just, you know, you, you made the rules. You wanted to do something, you went and did it, and, and there wasn't anybody to stop you. And Sack was having this epileptic fit. <laughs> well, you know how they are. You know, you got to have a reg to do this. You go to the restroom, what's the reg say? <laughs> so anyway, we go in and talk to them, and then we get back in a, in a bread truck, as I used to call them, headed out to the A1s. And just as we get there and get out, here comes this staff car. And they just come screaming up there, stop, this guy gets out, didn't even shut the door. I don't know, I think he's a lieutenant colonel. Blue shirt, blue pants, typical sack thing. So, hey, 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 wait a minute. PACAF called us. They want to know your clearance. They want to know when y'all went back and when y'all got checked out on all this. And, and how, how are you clear to fly these? Hey, well, you haven't been in, I, I don't know how many years and all that. And Jack and I looked at each other. <laughs> we looked at him, we said, yesterday. <laughs> That's pretty current. I said, last time I flew the A1 was yesterday, and I landed it, and I took off. And he just shook his head, got in the staff car, and left. But that was a funny moment for me. I said, well, what you clear? I said, yesterday. So we're here alive. So anyway, we got uh, the two birds that uh, Ken showed you there, and we took those up to Takali. And by that time, the F5s had been taken out, the A37s. The Air Force had sent a, some kind of a maintenance team around that had access to a cutting torch. And they'd pull the truck up to the AC-119 and they literally cut the guns out of the floor, didn't unbolt nothing, just cut the guns out of the floor and somehow hoist them out manpower onto truck beds. And they were going airplane to airplane to airplane. They had cut dashes out of some things that they couldn't, that had crash landed and skidded off. And they, it was hooks. There was a bunch of junk left after we got through taking what we wanted out and taking the airplanes we wanted out. And so we would have 
gone back and flown those A1s until the very last one got up to Tok Lee. But I think the State Department got so involved and the Thai government was so worried that the North Vietnamese military was coming to Thailand. They wanted to recover their spoils. And it was being written about. The CIA said, well, look out. They're talking about coming over there with a, they, they were going to fly some MiGs or something over there to just, you know, I, I don't know. My base commander, he was just ready to commit suicide if somebody come flying over his place. And they didn't have anything to fight back with, really. I mean, it was, Thailand wasn't that <clears throat> up to speed. They didn't have their F-16s at that time. So one of those things. So anyway, we put a halt to it. Adderhope called us and he said, hey, the, the State Department and uh, other people have gotten involved now and they will not let me s steal any more A1s. And I said, okay, so we had to shut it down. We hated that. There's more to the story about Trot. There's, uh, that's one of them right there, that's 332. There's a lot of things that went on that I'd be glad to talk to you all about later or tomorrow or any time, or I'm going to be here after this at Trot, because there was a lot of stories about picking people up uh, on the beach and other things. But it was a, the fall of Cambodia <coughs> was terrible, but we had a plan, and we recovered everything. Just typical Adderhope U.S. Air Force military stuff. Saigon, the bureaucracy got in effect. The civilians started or continued to run the war. And by the way, at one time, we had told them, if you'd let us go north, we'll make a parking lot out of North Vietnam. This war will be over. Amen. And so the other thing, as Douglas made a statement, the guy that built all those A1s, you know, they said, hey, did you, was there anything ever, did you ever do anything wrong in building the A1? He said, yeah, I didn't make enough. And that's right. So... When we got back, trot was still going on. Refugees were every th everywhere. Uh, the airplanes that we wanted were pretty much squared away. Four of them got up to Tok Lee. And if I can take a moment to finally get to, do you want to talk about that one A1 that you talked about? Yeah, go ahead. And then I'll tell them the final part about this is how Adderall uh, I think I don't need that. Uh, one quick question. I don't still don't understand. From the time those 10 A1s landed, I believe on the 29th, when were you flying them out? Well, the last flight was the 6th, I guess. So they've been sitting about a week or so? or 5th. Well, yes and no. They didn't all come at the same time. Okay. And, and I don't know, because see, they weren't all. Most of them had come out of Iran. Iran was a maintenance facility that did a lot of overhaul, do this, do that, fix up the engines and everything. So they were, that gave me a good feeling, seeing how I didn't have an ejection seat and, 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 and no brakes and no gun pins and no checklist, you know. So we thought, hey, these airplanes ought to fly. They flew in here, we can fly them out. So, but it was over the three or four days, I'd say five days. But you know, it took us two or three days to go down there, get them out of the water set them on the side, then decide what we're going to do with them. I have uh, befriended an A-1 pilot that had nine combat years of flying in the Vietnamese Air Force. All of them in A-1 with a uh, little bit of an exception checked out in the A-37. I don't speak Vietnamese, and so we have some communication things, so I'm not going to swear that everything I say is gospel, but I've been, I wrote a narrative about what I had learned from him. He, uh, Mel Swanson and I, the commander that uh, came with all the guys when we all started coming here the second year, he and I were talking about that one day and I said, wouldn't it be neat if we could find out who flew Neil Melton's airplane out of there? And uh, it's kind of a pipe dream. And we had that first year, the Jim Wolf day, we had a Vietnamese pilot, uh, Swoon, and uh, Sw Swan Pham, or however you want to say all these things. But, uh, and he said, you know, he didn't know. He got out dip in a different fashion. But he put me in touch. Eventually, I got in touch with this other Vietnamese pilot that flew so many combat missions. And Ho. 
He lives in the Dallas area, and I think we all, Ken, you and I, and, and Neil, and we need to try to do our best to get, get this guy uh, somewhere and talk. And, I, I, and later on, and, and the first time I talked to him, he said, we didn't pay any attention to tail numbers. He didn't know what he flew out of there, neither you know, any of us. However, later on, he was uh, conversing with a captain Captain knew that he had flown 665. And my understanding was that the airplanes then, uh, the squadron, I don't remember which number, had been buoyed. I don't know if all 10 airplanes came out of there, but I think the bulk of them did. And they flew over on the 29th. And they flew, I think they all 10 from what he told me. And one of his friends had a rough engine. And the A1, which is not totally unusual. I don't think I ever can say I had one. And a lot of things going on here, so there was confusion. And Ann Ho went back to look for his buddy because they got separated. At first, I thought he told me they never found him. That wasn't true. I got, we got the language working well enough to figure that out. But in so doing, he got separated became the last guy to land uh, over there in Thailand. And he said that when he got there, the planes were not already in a hangar, and they were already putting paint on them to try to disguise them or cover up some of the stuff. This is what I think I understand. And there's no hero's welcome, that because they didn't know what these guys were that flew these airplanes in, what their political persuasion was or whatever. And so some of those planes that came in with lots of people on them didn't want to be over in Thailand, um, if I understand that correctly. And maybe it was an isolated yeah. case. But then he told me, um, we started talking, there was an 11th uh, airplane. And that one was at, let's see, if we get, can you get that map up there with uh, Benoit and Benoit and okay, and then to Tansanu, which are very close to each other. And when Benoit, I believe, was the first base that that picture showed North Vietnamese running across the ramp. I may be wrong about that. People over Tansanu, there was an E model over there, and this guy wanted to get out of there. And I, I don't have a name for the pilot. I don't know which model, which of the four. However, uh, they, they had to get a battery, and they were trying to charge a battery and get the heck out of there while they could still get out of there. Finally, they got a battery, and he told me 16 people, I don't know if that accounted the pilot or not, all piled in the back of that E model, and flew down to Ben Tui. And if I understand this correctly, when he arrived there, there wasn't much fuel on that airplane, and he went, uh, in to go land there, and they, and Ho, at that time, they were starting to fly fly passes because that base was about to be overrun. So he didn't go, he, if he landed, he was going to be prisoner of war, that's whatever he, they did to these poor people that didn't get out of it. So then he flew to another place, and I didn't even know what this was, and I guess it's Dung Dong. It's a little island that's down here south of Cambodia. And he went there, and that little island was a prisoner of war camp where the South Vietnamese held North Vietnamese prisoners. And he thought he could land there. They had a pretty good sized runway in the middle of that little island. However, they were also in the process of surrender to the North Vietnamese forces. So he chose to go down and land on the very tip of this thing called An Poi, I believe, where the Navy had a little base, and there was a 3,500 foot PSP runway there. 16 people on the airplane. He successfully lands the airplane on the tip of that little island. So he needs fuel, he needs a battery charge, 
And so they are in all 16 of them, and they managed to get this, if I understand it correctly. Then the next day, the decision had to be made, where are you going to take off? You know, can we get this thing airborne at 3,500 feet with a lot of people on it? And the choice was made to not take off over the water because he thought that everybody would perish if they did ditch. So he took off over land, staggered away, and ended up going to Thailand. And that is the story that I believe is correct from what I understood how the 11th airplane got there. So thanks for that. Thank you. I just find all of this so fantastic. He had 16 fantastic. people on an A1? He had 16 people crammed in, a, in an EMOB. They had, some of those planes were just packed with people. <clears throat> Colonel Warsh was the DO at JustMag right after General Adderholt retired. And General Adderholt made a deal with him. He said, I want those four A1s at Tok Lee. So the story, as it goes, Colonel Warsh flew up there in a C-12, went to look at them. They were sitting in the far corner of the Tok Lee Air Force Base. They were a mess. It had been raining, paint had been peeling, tires were flat. They just didn't look too good. So he told General Adderholt what the story was, and uh, Adderholt told the RTAF, if you can get them to where I can get them out of there, I'll buy them. Well, he ran into some bureaucracy beyond belief. They were South Vietnamese airplanes, but I let me back up. They were U.S. Air Force originally airplanes. We gave them to a government that didn't exist anymore and pilots for that government flew them to Thailand, and Thailand said, we don't want them, they're not ours. So here we are. So Adderholt had one or two friends left in the embassy, and somehow he got a letter, and he said it's so important to get the letter and get it in writing that the Thai Air Force had the authority to sell those airplanes to General Adderholt. So, he contacted the squadron commander of the A-37 South Vietnamese group in Tok Lee and said, you clean them up, I'll, I'll pay you. Well, we show up, and they look like they're off the production line. I mean, it's unbelievable. They had been cleaned up, new tires fixed up. The wings are off because they're getting ready to be taken out of Thailand, yet to be determined how General Adderholt was going to get that done. But those are the those are the four right there that Jack Drummond and I flew to Tok Lee. So they decided after they had the A-37 squadron commander paid off, getting them to the port was this kind of a nightmare. And that he meant all the way down to Bangkok. But then he got to thinking, hey, there's a Chop Yai River over here pretty close. If I can get somebody to put those on a truck and get them over there and I hire some borges, we'll take the borges and float them down the, the river all the way to the port of Bangkok and I'll find a boat and pay them to get them over there. I mean, it's a, it, only Adderholt could have pulled this off because he knew a lot of ties. If you ever get into the story of how he got back into the Air Force as a retired colonel and got commissioned as a brigadier general because that's what the ties wanted, and the State Department said that would be it. Uh, I heard the rumor that the BG list had just been approved by the Senate or whomever, and somebody was redlined off of the BG list so Adderholt could be put on there because they could only promote so many by law. So somebody was crying in their beer that night when they said, not so fast, don't, don't, buy, don't buy that one star yet, you know? So out of retirement comes Brigadier General Adderholt, and it, it was just so fortunate for our country. I can't tell you enough about that. Anyway, they took the airplanes and the wings by truck to the barges. They put the, airplane, uh, the wings on one barge, and they had a, a barge per airplane for the rest. The only thing was those things are pretty heavy, and they would have to go so slow and that they were sitting on the top of the barge, like the, the barge had a flat deck roof. Well. That didn't work. It would get, became top heavy. So they cut the top out of the barge and, and then they let the airplanes down in there three or four foot and they had to cut notches in the sides of the barge for the stubs of the wings. So this is an unbelievable sight floating down the Chapya River. But anyway, Adderholt got it done. 
So they go down to the port, and uh, what else could Adderholt do but hire a Russian trawler to hire, <laughs> to, to ferry four A1s who we had been fighting against the Russian government's North Vietnamese forces back to the United States, but he did it. And so they wound up in L.A., Port of L.A., Long Beach. So here's the A1s as they get back into the States. I'm not sure that's a picture, but they were on their way. Go ahead. We lost 191 A1s to combat. The Navy lost 65. VNAV, we don't know exactly. Uh, 3,180 of them were built. Could have used a few more. Go ahead. 332 is at the Smithsonian. If you ever get in there, you might ask somebody, can I go in the back room and look at it? Because it's probably not restored. Okay. 606, the one I flew, is up in uh, Kavanaugh, up in Addison at the museum, and they're having their big show next month, and it would be nice if anybody could make it. 683 is in Colorado, and as I was told, it's on its way here. And then 665 flew this morning, and its home is right here. So you can thank Brigadier General Adderholt and a Russian trawler for getting that airplane here to this airfield. But uh, there's a lot more to it than just that, but uh, I'm just glad I had a part in it. And, and I went on from pulling off that stunt I was the short tour poster boy for PACAF. At that time, I had seven short tours in a row, including the two tours in Vietnam and some other stuff that I had done for Adderholt. He got me an A7 assignment out of there when everybody else went to desk jobs or whatever. And I went to Davis Monthan. Yes, sir. Smithsonian, Colorado. Kavanaugh, Texas, and here. It's in the paint job at Delta. It'll be ready for the show next next month. Thank you. So anyway, Adderholt took care of me, which I thank him to this day. And I got into A7s. I've been in attack airplanes all my life, but I've flown everything that turns whatever. And I'll tell you in just a second, but he got me into A7s when I got to Davis Monthan, and, and I checked out in that. All of a sudden, the A10 was coming online back in the day, and the A7s had to leave Davis Monthan and go to Myrtle Beach, which was another hardship tour for me. But the A10s went to Davis Monthan, so I flew SAR. When they found out I'd been a Sandy pilot and all, I was helping to write the SAR manual for the A7s at Myrtle Beach. And then as one squadron transitioned to A-10s and then another squadron, I was in the last A-7 squadron at 353rd at Myrtle Beach to transition to A-10s. So there was another attack airplane as I got into the A-10. And you don't have to fly that A-10 but about one time to the range and shoot that 30 millimeter Gatlin gun and all the rest and, to, and see that thing turn at 22 degrees per second to know they just put a zero on the end of an A-1 and, and I'm telling you, that airplane was exactly what we needed at the time. And many, many civilians, if I can say that, have tried to kill it, as you well know. And it, the Army just about won't let it go. And we've modified that thing on and on till now. The A-10 has done a tremendous work in Iraq and everywhere else. Talk about the highway back out of Kuwait back to <coughs> Iraq. And that, that, that A-10 just, you know, unbelievable. Yeah, I think so. And I, the latest thing on military.com was they, they've got a head of steam to do it this time but because they're saying the F-35 can do the A-10's role. Well, you go, you go below a 1,000 foot trying to support a cash environment, and you say, I got 15 minutes of playtime, and that's what you got with the F-35. It, it may be cosmic, but it's not the A-1, and it's not the A-10, and, and we continue to learn hard lessons. So anyway, in my, the reason I said I flew a lot, and I'm happy that I did, I didn't have a normal Air Force tour for 24 years. When you come out of uh, pilot training and you fly a tour in 
unbelievable airplane. I actually flew the C-123K model. Two resets, that engine, and two jets. And I hated it, but there wasn't anything else. But my squadron commander said, listen, you go to Vietnam, you'll fly six times every day for a year. You'll come out of there with a proficiency level and judgment level that far beats these guys that's flying back seat F4s and other things. And I said, okay. And it was right. But I volunteered, like I said, second day I got there to fly the A-1. And the VNAV had an A-1 squadron right at base ops where my squadron was, and I bisted with them nearly all day long. But you want another laugh is walking into the A-1 RTU at Hurlburt and him, the, the squadron commander there, looking at my sheet, and he said, you come from where? He said, you're in the wrong squadron here. You need to go down to C-47 squadron or something, you know, because I had volunteered out of 123s for the A-1. But, hey, 52 inches is 52 inches. I don't care what airplane you're in, and I loved it. So, anyway, out of that to the AU-24, I may have been the only American pilot to fly the Cambodian AU-24. AU-23, Peacemaker, I back I flew the T-28, back seat, OV-10, checked out left seat in the C-47 for the Embassy Just Mag run in the old days from Bangkok to Saigon and back. Uh, A-7, A-10, and wound up. Believe it or not, I was in Korea. They said, you will do a desk tour after 18 years. So I got a two-year tour at the 604 DAS, Direct Air Support Squadron, for the Army General in Korea. And <laughs> practically two weeks before my retirement, on the 20th day, this phone call rings, and it's PACAF uh, personnel, and saying, or, uh, yeah, PACAF at Hawaii. And said, young blood, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what am I not going to believe? You're the only man in the computer for this assignment that's coming up. I said, yeah, sure. He said, no, really. He said, we had a guy go through DLI uh, language training for Thai and didn't make it. And he was like three months from graduating. <coughs> he said, you're the only guy with 1115 AFSC that's been to Thai language school that has a fighter pilot AFSC and we got a short fill back to Thailand to work for Just Mag. I said, throw me in that briar patch. <laughs> no, you know, they said, you got to do one year while we send somebody to DLI, but you can do four. I said, count me for four. So I sent me to uh, Washington to whatever, where the Air Force One is, and they, they got the C-12s there for checking out, you know. So I went through a C-12 checkout and then back over to Just Mag, and we had two C-12s. One belonged to the embassy, and the other one belonged to Just Mag. But I got to go back around to all the bases. I got, this was 88 to 92. And during this time frame, a lot of things was going on back and forth with the North Vietnamese government and the U.S. <coughs> government. So I actually took some, I guess, State Department people from Bangkok to uh, North, uh, Hanoi and landed there. And MiGs were parked on the side of the runway and everything. I mean, you know, hey, land there, go in with passport checks and all this kind of stuff. And we spent four days in Hanoi waiting on the State Department people to do their thing. I'm telling you, that's like seeing a picture of North Korea and South Korea. And there's one light on in North Korea, and that's at the Capitol. And the, and the South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree. That, that country, I, I don't know. If, if the military had run the war, we would have won, and that's just my thoughts. But I'm proud of 24 years. I'm proud of uh, being here today. and. I thank you all, and I thank uh, Don, and I thank Ken again. So thank you very much. You have the inside. Have the inside. Shot three, King two seven. Has your bingo this time? Okay, I'm gonna fly down the river. Down the river. Tell me when I'm over your location. Over your location. A bit longer until uh, Alamo two gets in a little bit of shape. Yeah, I'm going to win another five minutes early. Okay, so we're holding another five minutes. Fantasy 3 2 on, Victor. Go ahead. Shooting uh, keep everybody uh, alive and back there at the IP. Alright, Red Sherman, Alamo 2, I'm sorry, he's still with the Okay, babe, how far was I? Was I right over you? Was I right over you? Uh, Sorry, Victor, I'm sorry. Okay, we're going to fly down the river. Down the river. Down the river. Down the river. Okay, two, is that you over the uh, survivor's location?